For Crema Media's policy, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is the BLSA CEO, Busi Mavuso, to discuss State of the Nation Address 2022. So while you say President Ramaphosa made encouraging announcements uh, during his 2022 State of the Nation Address, you say business was hoping for a greater sense of agency. Do you not view him as being pro-growth and also being pro-investment? We absolutely have no doubt in our minds as business that the president is definitely pro-growth and pro-investment. But being pro-growth and pro-investment at some point is going to have to translate into action. He's got a responsibility, especially in, in the context of where we find ourselves as a country, in the context of where we find ourselves as an economy. So now you're sitting in an environment where you have 45.6% unemployment in terms of the expanded definition, where you have more people that are unemployed than those that are employed in all the provinces except Hauden and the Western Cape. You're sitting in an environment where our debt continues to skyrocket as a country, where we're sitting with this huge albatross around our necks of the SOE debt, you know, and the government guarantees that have to be continuously to be issued to the SOEs. So let's acknowledge that our economy is at the edge of the precipice if we are not in the precipice already. So if we are therefore in this serious economic dire straits, you know, if we agree that we are in an economy that is in serious trouble, which is demonstrated by the 70% youth unemployment, you would like to think that we would see radical measures being implemented. So it's all good and well that we say the right things and continue to pronounce the right things. But unfortunately, we have been saying the right things for the past five years and more as a country. But very little is happening in as far as implementation is concerned. So the litmus test, therefore, you know, for this country, for this government, is to how quickly and how urgently can they convert the plans that we have as a country into action? You know, and unfortunately, we are sitting in an environment where it is now underwhelming when the government or the president says it is going to do something. Because we are spot on in terms of our diagnosis, in terms of what needs to be done, but the implementation is not urgent enough. The implementation is not forthcoming. You know, we continue to deal, you know, with these constraints, with these bottlenecks. We are probably maybe hoping for a big bang announcement of a way in which to break out of this inertia that is seemingly, you know, bogging down our country and our economy. Your organization, PLSA, believes that uh, there is a solid progress now on the Zondo State Commission's report, as well as the expert panel's findings on the unrest that we saw in July 2021. Can you tell us about that? We welcome the Zondo report and all its recommendations, and uh, we stand ready and have already raised our hands as the private sector and as the organization that is representing big businesses in this country that we are happy to start working with the NPA and whatever prosecuting authority agencies that are there to work towards bringing the thieves that were responsible for the state capture project in this country to book. I think a lot of people are disheartened about the slow pace, you know, at which these prosecutions have happened. Actually, as we speak, there is no one behind bars. As we speak, no one has been held accountable. As we speak, there's no one that has actually been put in orange overall. So I think we would like to therefore quickly move towards an environment and a space where we can actually see uh, the prosecution starting and the NPA actually starting to bring these thieves into book as it were. Shamila Patoy has actually come out and she's actually seemingly a little bit more ready this time around to actually uh, work with the private sector and is actually uh, pleading with the nation to keep an open mind in letting the private sector help fund the National Prosecuting Authority. And I think that announcement by Shamila Potoy is actually very welcome by business and we'll wait to see 
how she plans to put it into effect. But we are definitely ready, you know, as the business constituency, to look at how we can actually uh, ensure that uh, we can bring uh, these things to book, you know, as it were. And I think if you're going to look at the July anarchy and the report that has come out, the assistance that we're giving to the National Prosecuting Authority, we believe that that will go a long way in terms of starting to deal with what we saw in the July anarchy and starting to deal with those that have been implicated uh, uh, in the July anarchy. You know, we haven't had much from the authorities in terms of uh, even a single person being held accountable for what happened uh, last year in the country. So we're hoping that with the NPA being more open to receiving assistance from the, from the private sector, it would mean that those thieves will also be brought into book so that we ensure that a recurrence of what happened last year, July, doesn't happen again you know, in the country. And now when we look at the issue of redesigning loan schemes uh, for small businesses, and the appointment of Siponko, you say that your organization has been longing for such changes, especially after our economy has been battered by the ravages of COVID-19 lockdowns. Do you now believe that these initiatives will yield positive results? The appointment of Siponko is definitely a positive move, which we definitely welcome as business, and we're looking forward to working with him. We've already been contacted by the presidency to offer assistance. Uh, as business to Mr. Siponko see in the mandate that has been given. But what is actually going to be interesting is to what mandate has been given to Mr. Siponko see. Because it's one thing, you know, for him to be requested to look at what are some of the interventions that should be put in place to deal with the red tape. But once he has done that work and has given the report to the president, once again, it will be interesting to see how quickly you know, implementation will follow. Because I think we are sitting in that problem as a country that you have all these commissions, you've got all these committees that have been put in place to deal with uh, some of the problems that we're facing as a country. But the committees will do their work. It is still up to the government to implement. It is still up to the government to actually ensure that those recommendations that come up from these committees you know, are actually implemented. So it will be interesting to see how quickly those will be implemented. So the appointment of Mr. Sipokosi in and of itself is not the solution. You know, the solution would be once he has done his work, you know, how quickly is the government going to go ahead, you know, and implement. But having said that, I'm not taking any credit from his appointment. We we were really looking forward to working with him and to providing him all the resources and the support that is going to require from business for him to be able to deliver on the mandate that has been given by the president. I'm not sure, by the way, what his mandate is and what his role allows him to do, you know? Um, so we, we, we're looking forward to rolling up our sleeves as business and getting our hands dirty in as far as that is concerned. And do you also support now the announcement of a former APSA CEO, Daniel Minele, as head of the Presidential Climate Finance Task Team, and what would you like to see that team uh, do to most effectively take forward the COP26 uh, offer? I think you can already see the theme, you know, that has been occurring over the past few years. You know, so yet another appointment, yes, yet another task team, yet another mm-hmm. committee, you know, more recommendations. So this is what we've been doing for the past five years or for the past however long. And we welcome all of these things, Sane. So the issue is not in the appointment of task teams or setting up these people. We've been doing this and we're brilliant at it. You know, but the problem is where do all these reports go? Where do all these recommendations go? What happens to them once they land at the desk of the president? So we definitely welcome uh, the appointment of Daniel Minele And again, if he requires the assistance of business, we stand ready as business to definitely work with him. And what we'd obviously like to see is what is it that we need to do as a country to be able to position ourselves and to be able to quickly draw down, you know, from this facility that we've actually been granted by the COP26 in as far as dealing with our climate issues is concerned. 
So I would like to think that the mandate that has been given is to actually look at how do we ready ourselves or what is it that we have to have in place as a country so that we can be able to access that funding because that funding is not a blank check. You know, it comes with conditionalities and for us to be able to access it, we'll have to conform to certain requirements, you know, from COP26. So the sooner we can put those interventions in place, the better, you know, the sooner we can actually ensure that we ready ourselves to actually access that funding, the better. That is what I'm hoping that Daniel Minella has been given as a mandate. But what will be critical to ensure his success is, of course, government is going to have to be willing and ready to remove whatever constraints that are necessary from a legislation perspective to enable South Africa Inc. to access that funding. Because if government is not going to move quickly now, then unfortunately, you know, the funding is not going to be forthcoming. So we therefore have to be ready. As I'm saying that the appointment of the task team in and of itself is not what should be celebrated. You know, what we should be celebrating and what we should be looking forward to hearing is how ready is government to remove some of the constraints and the barriers that we, we know are there from a legislative perspective to be able to access this finance in this case. So I think we'll see how that one turns out as well. And what is your organization's now reaction on what has been widely debated in our country, the 350 uh, social grant relief? We know that it's now extended to 2023. I think this was a brilliant move from the president. I think he really moved cautiously on this one, Sane, because I think the concern of, of business leadership South Africa in as far as the extension of the 350 social relief uh, 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 grant is concerned was that we should not move too quickly as a country to turning this grant or the basic income grant that has been discussed uh, for the past few years as a country, you know, into a permanent grant. We are worried that the conversion thereof into a permanent basic income grant would probably in the long run pose problems for the country. Let's first acknowledge and agree that there is an obvious need for more extensive social welfare support in the country. If you're sitting with 10 million people who are unemployed, Let's agree, you know, that that is a recipe for disaster and it is definitely an urgent situation that we need to attend to as a country. But however, in putting in place permanent solutions to deal with, with, with the crises that we're facing and as far as unemployment is concerned, that is an area that needs careful research into the repercussions that will come from implementing a basic income grant or a permanent basic income grant. Because a permanent basic income grant will mean higher tax rates and possibly increased debt levels, which will have a negative impact on the rest of the economy. And if you're looking at what propensity we have as a country to increase tax rates, you will see that we don't have any propensity at all. We actually have a low propensity because we are not in a position to continuously increase the tax rates for the handful of people that are currently earning enough to pay pay as you earn. I think the numbers in the country at the moment, if I'm not mistaken, is that you have about 7 million people earning enough to pay pay as you earn, and you've got about 18 million people that are dependent on some form of social grant or the other. So increasing taxes therefore means that you continue to burden the minimal 7 million base, you know, that earn enough to end taxes. And that is not a sustainable option because you are sitting in an environment where a lot of people who are actually professionals in this country are leaving the country because they are worried about, and, and I'm not saying that they are leaving because of high taxes, but when you look at it from a comparative perspective, you will see, you know, that we are probably maybe one of the highest uh, taxed 
countries in the world or countries with the highest taxes as it were. You know, this is true for corporate taxes as well, which are currently sitting at 27%. So increasing tax rates is therefore not an option. And I think I've already spoken about the high uh, or increased debt levels. You know, uh, we are not sitting in a position and in an environment where we can actually continue to increase debt levels. So we were worried about if the president was going to go the permanent basic income grant option, you know, that was going to have dire and negative uh, consequences and repercussions for the rest of the economy. So the president's pledge to seek ways to expand South Africa's social relief program, but without crippling the fiscals, is precisely what BLSA has been calling for on this important policy. And we definitely also welcome his promise to engage in, in, in broad consultations and technical work to identify the best options to replace this grant. And we definitely will be working with the presidency in as far as this is concerned. And for the first time, we saw the DA and some uh, political parties, the opposition parties, uh, happy that a uh, government said business creates jobs while government is expected to create a fatal ground which will in turn decrease the issue of unemployment in our country. What is your comment on this issue? I'm glad that finally government has come to that realization. The business of government is not to create jobs. The business of government is to create a conducive environment within which business has to operate. And if business finds itself in that conducive environment within which they can operate, then the only logical result, Sunny, is that there will be economic growth. And because of economic growth, you will start arresting the jobs crisis that we have as a country. Because jobs are a function of supply and demand. So if government therefore sets out to create jobs, you know, it can only be temporary interventions or it can be job opportunities, but it cannot be sustainable jobs. So I'm glad, you know, that that accession has been made. And I'm hoping that following that accession, as I've said, we are therefore going to see more determination and more agency in terms of implementing some of those reforms that are required for us to attain a conducive environment within which business needs to operate. Because we've been talking about some of these issues, you know, for quite a while. You know, issues such as the auctioning of the spectrum, which I think the president touched on, you know, because that has got the opportunity and the propensity to actually attract investment into the country in the form of 5G. Issues such as ensuring energy security, and ensuring that you open up that industry so that there is more competition that is actually coming in, you know, so that there can be more investment that can come, you know, into the country. You know, so dealing with the bottlenecks is also going to be important in as far as the, the self-generation for 100 megawatts is concerned. You know, you would remember that there was the big thing announcement by the president in terms of the lifting of the license exemption to allow the private sector to can actually produce their own electricity up to 100 megawatts. But what we are currently dealing with, and as far as that is concerned, there are serious bottlenecks when you try to apply for a license or when you try to apply for going ahead with breaking ground in as far as setting up that, that, that power plant, that, that those power plants are concerned. So I'm hoping that that is going to be forthcoming as well, because as soon as those bottlenecks are dealt with, then you are going to see a lot of investment that is actually going to come through. You know, we are also going to have to go ahead and quickly announce the next bid window to allow the process to start. I think last year, October, if I'm not mistaken, Minister Guedemantash spoke about announcing the sixth bid window in January. You know, January has come and gone and we still haven't seen any announcement. So those are the issues that government has to actually immerse themselves in. You know, sorting out of the ports, for instance, the ports in this country are a mess. So once you, 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 you don't have the network industries working the way they are supposed to work, then you do not have a conducive environment within which business is operating in this country. So the focus of government, therefore, has to be in ensuring, you know, that those network industries are capacitated, you know, and that they are properly managed so that we can aid growth 
uh, because if they are not attended to, then unfortunately this continues to be growth inhibited. And finally, will business now support a president's call for a business, labor, communities, as well as government to take forward a social compact for growth and job creation? What do you think can be achieved by such a social compact? We have entered into so many social compacts in this country. I've actually lost count. So I'm not sure what, what this social compact is going to be about. You know. Uh, from where we are sitting as business, we thought that the economic recovery and reconstruction plan that business, government, labor, and civil society worked on and agreed on in October 2020 was that social compact. Because we were very clear that in putting together that plan, you know, it was a social compact for all of us as the different social partners to deal with the poverty, unemployment, and inequality. So I think we will have to wait to see what the president has in mind for this new consensus deal that we ought to get into. But you see, getting into social compacts, putting together more plans, agreeing more things is not actually going to help us. You know, we are not against it, you know, as business, but we are just saying that the plans that we have in the country are more than enough and are more than sufficient to move South Africa, you know, toward the different economic trajectory, you know, to ensure that we can make certain significant shifts towards the eradication of unemployment, poverty, and inequality. So what matters now is implementation. It is not more uh, complex. It is not more task teams. It is not more committees. It is not more discussions. You know, we really need to move towards implementation. We need to start putting together, you know, or in place, you know, very concrete targets and timelines, which are actually going to articulate when we plan to achieve the many plans that we have as a country. But having said that, we definitely look forward to discussing yet another social compact And hopefully, after this social compact, we can move very quickly towards implementation. That was Business Leadership CEO Busima Vuso in conversation with Polity about the State of the Nation Address 2022.